And what may be the nature of the figure which I am to shape out by this motion which you are pleased to denote by the word upward? I presume it is describable in the language of Flatland? Oh, certainly. It is all plain and simple, and in strict accordance with analogy. Only, by the way, you must not speak of the result as being a figure, but as a solid. But I will describe it to you. Or rather, not I, but analogy. We begin with a single point, which of course being itself a point, has only one terminal point. One point produces a line with two terminal points. One line produces a square with four terminal points. Now you can give yourself the answer to your own question. One, two, four, are evidently in geometrical progression. What is the next number? Eight. Exactly. The one square produces a something which you do not as yet know a name for, but which we call a cube with eight terminal points. Now are you convinced? And has this creature sides as well as angles or what you call terminal points? Of course. And all according to the analogy. But, by the way, not what you call sides, but what we call sides. You would call them solids. And how many solids or sides will appertain to this being whom I am to generate by the motion of my inside in an upward direction, and whom you call a cube? How can you ask? And you a mathematician? The side of anything is always, if I may so say, one dimension behind the thing. Consequently, as there is no dimension behind a point, a point has zero sides. A line if I may so say, has two sides, for the points of a line may be called by courtesy its sides. A square has four sides. Zero, two, four. What progression do you call that? Arithmetical. And what is the next number? Six. Exactly. Then you see you have answered your own question. The cube which you will generate will be bounded by six sides. That is to say, six of your insides. You see it now now, eh? Monster! Be thou... Juggler, enchanter, dream or devil? No more will I endure thy mockeries. Either thou or I must perish. Ah! So I don't think there's a great deal that we really need to say about Edward Abbott Abbott, born in 1838 in London, England, educated at the St. John's College in Cambridge. He won prizes for achievements in mathematics and classics, and he also studied theology, and indeed became an Anglican priest at one point. He was the headmaster at his old alma mater, the City of London School. And he was quite young at the time, only 26 years old. He wrote many textbooks on things like Shakespearean grammar and Via Latina, which was an early primer for Latin student beginners. And his theological studies were numerous. Some of them were published anonymously, and they may have taken more of the form of theological romances. His best-known work today, though, is Flatland. The novella published in 1884 by Seeley and Company. Now, it is interesting that there were other books at the time dealing with interdimensional communication. In fact, published that very same year was Charles Howard Hinton's A Plain World, and it seems to cover somewhat similar ground, but perhaps even its author acknowledged that it wasn't as influential as Flatland as he himself also wrote a sequel of sorts to Flatland in 1907 called An Episode in Flatland. It's very weird how Flatland seems to have had this vast influence. Yeah. Considering how unremarkable the author seems in other aspects and how nothing else that he wrote really seems that much worth commenting on. A lot of people have read Flatland, and there are not only sequels, 
but there are other stories set in Flatland. As well as, like, film adaptations and things like that. Yes, there's two recent-ish film adaptations. There are both from 2007, which is kind of interesting. Uh, One is a longer film, and it seems to be mostly the product of some art student doing CGI on their computer, and some guests like voice actors and maybe other animation-related people. The other one is a short film, about 30 minutes long, and includes some pretty well-known actors doing voice roles. And it does seem like the shorter work is closer to the original text. The long one, I think that there was some sort of extrapolation of the political, sociological aspects of the book, and they really went to town with that stuff, which is a worthy way to take it i no, think for sure but absolutely. i didn't actually watch either of the films no so i didn't I can't either. really comment on yeah. yeah but i was just kind of surprised that a work like this would have so many adaptations yeah i mean so you there's also more. see yeah right there's, you see there's similar a lot more plots in star trek as well as the orville was it in star which star trek would... there was a next generation episode that was really yeah it's kind of similar okay. uh, idea i i don't remember that but i'll take your word for it because i've been i have been watching rewatching that show but it's kind of random order so i just don't yeah uh, yeah but so there are there are many other ones though i'm gonna list some of them here so aside from an episode in flatland there's also flatland 2001 by ian stewart who's a mathematician and there is some other stuff too there's a flatland role-playing game rudy rucker who we mentioned before in our hollow earth episode he is also an accomplished mathematician And he has written many books, but among them is his book Spaceland from 2002, and also a short story from the early 80s, which was published in his 1983 collection, The 57th Franz Kafka. And the name of the story is A Message Found in a Copy of Flatland. There's also The Planiverse, Computer Contact with a Two-Dimensional World by A.K. Dudney. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. There's also something that I wanted to mention that I discovered in the early 2000s when I was doing a workshop presentation. And it's a, sort of a graphic novel that was published in the early 2000s. And it's called Voss, an opera in Flatland. And it is written by somebody named Steve Tomasula. That graphic novel is a very experimental, sort of postmodern, intertextual work that ties in a lot with eugenics and various scientific phenomena. It interweaves fiction and nonfiction, graphics and text in really interesting experimental ways. Yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing for sure. I would definitely suggest that some people might want to check that out because it is something really different and it's interesting use of the concept. Yeah. It has really a lot to do with, again, like, the science of genetics and and different like ideas about works in a lot of heavy issues like race and gender and right. like it's, a, it's a definitely an interesting work that I would like to study more maybe at some point because I didn't really get a chance to go on into it and because of a lot of the intertextual tricks it was sort of yeah a little bit obscure to me but it was really interesting to do a project on that so. I first found out about Flatland many, many years ago. It's kind of a funny story. Back in 1999, I got my first Windows operating PC. Before that, I'd been using like a DOS machine and Mm -hmm. I got a CD-ROM that came with some piece of software that I had and it was like everything that had been put on Gutenberg up to that point. Yeah. And because Edward, Edwin Abbott is like very close to the beginning of the list. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is Flatland? Yeah. So I decided to read it. It is one of the first novels that they put up on Gutenberg. The, I think, first edition of Flatland they put up is ebook number 97. Wow. Yeah, pretty close to the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty, pretty great. So there's definitely a lot of interesting historical significance to this. And I don't know. I mean, the way I found it is just kind of funny at the time. It didn't take me long to read. I guess I didn't really think about it that much, but I'm just, you know, I just kind of thought, wow, that's really interesting early science fiction. Right. I was about 19 at that time. So I'm 18 or 19. So yeah, that's, it's a while. So coming back to it now was interesting. I definitely thought about it a lot more. Mm -hmm. So this was published as Flatland, a romance in many dimensions. 
and the author is listed as a square. Yeah. <laughs> and indeed, the square is the narrator of our book, and he is a square because yep. he lives in a two-dimensional world. We do begin with a preface, which I debated whether I wanted to actually read anything from this preface on the air because there's some kind of funny parts to it, but I decided not to. But this apparently comes from the editor, but it actually is, is just Edwin himself. But all he wants, he's talking about the writer of this book, The Square, and all he wants is for consciousness to expand and for knowledge of the greater dimensions to be given to the people of the world. And he wants this to happen without a sense of superiority because people need to have a conception of the infinite to humble themselves, I suppose. The inhabitants of space must be modest about their dimensional access. Now, the Flatlander, Square, has been locked up for his intellectual heresy and moral degradation. He once was allowed a glimpse of the third dimension, which can be understood in theory, but is incomprehensible to Flatland beings. The same would be true of the concept of a fourth dimension to us, the Spacelanders, the three-dimensional dwellers. Now, obviously, as discussed in some of our previous episodes, like the episodes on time travel, right. we have this theoretical idea of a fourth dimension being time, but that need not necessarily be so. I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable hypothesis on one level, but, I mean, there's no, there's no reason why that has to be the fourth dimension or the tenth dimension or any other no, and numerical I don't, series, really. I don't think he really attributes anything to the fourth dimension of it being temporally related in this at all. Well, not in this, no. Yeah. But this predates, like, this, yeah, this doesn't appear to have any knowledge of that conception. Yeah. I mean, it was already around at the time, but barely. We talked about that in our time travel episode and how people were lengthening it to things like telepathy and stuff like that. Right. So, flatland people... That is, the two-dimensional peoples are defined by their shapes. Women are all like sharp points. The triangles are lower class, and the isosceles triangles lowest of all. They are mostly soldiers. And moving on into the equilateral triangle region, we have tradesmen and professionals. The squares, well, they're squares. They're square intellectuals. And each generation increases in terms of its sides. So he begins the narrative of the square, and he tells us to envision Flatland as a large piece of paper where shapes move freely about on the surface without rising or falling. Even the apparent shapes are a result of looking from above. So essentially, the people of Flatland see each other as straight lines. Uh, he wants to demonstrate this to you by saying that you should put your eye to the edge of a table or surface and observe how a penny ceases to be a circle and looks instead like a line, as do all the shapes on a piece of paper if you regard them from their level. And flatlanders are all attracted south by some kind of magnetism. Rain falls from the north and houses are mostly shaped like pentagons triangular and square houses being outlawed because of dim and dangerous angles. Women enter from the small eastern door and men from the large western door. I did like the one small throwaway detail of how, like, you can still find a square houses in these remote antiquated villages. Yeah, in the more parochial yeah. regions, <laughs> right? People don't know better. Like barbarians. Class divisions among the flatlanders are in place because of the number of sides or angles. Yeah, yeah quite literally hard-coded in. Yeah. And occasionally the triangles, which are sort of the lower class of citizens, they can be made to rise higher in status and can be born from isosceles and grow into equal. And then the next generation could be equilateral or sometimes they use like surgical means to sort of shave the angles a little bit, I guess. But it gives them some hope. And I think right. that's the point. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So the circles are the priest caste. And they essentially rule the entire society. And the main goal of an isosceles is to achieve an angle of 60 degrees. So this is really important. And apparently it takes many, many generations to do. Like, it's not something one can easily achieve. No. 
So the women are very much an oppressed class, and they seem to be sharp double lines for the most part, and they are also kind of dangerous because they're able to puncture with the points of their lines. So there's all sorts of laws and decrees in this society, and one of the laws is that women, when they walk around, they have to, like, sing this thing they call the peace cry, and it's, I guess, like a warning for unwary shapes that might not realize that there's a woman around that might accidentally kill them, I guess. And it's interesting because the narrator Square admits that the position of women in Flatland is not very good. Yeah. And he says, well, at least they have no memories or intellects with which to pine for greater things. But he still seems to feel some regret. And it's not only that. He sort of feels like the circles, especially some of their strictures and edicts, are more harmful on the society than they should be. Not only does the fact that women not being educated cause some problems because now young men have to learn to speak on two levels and he feels like because the square is a mathematician himself as well as a lawyer of some sort, he feels as though education among the menfolk is also dropping because the women are not able to, like, they're basically declared as unintellectual. Right. Now, we learn more about the lay of the land in Flatland, and we learn that fog is a very valuable thing because sight recognition is something that has to be taught and is only learned or learned well among the elites. And among the nobility, they don't really feel each other. But the lower classes, in order to tell the shape and the distinction of an individual, they tend to go by feel. And the square mathematician has a hard time with sight recognition. He's not even able to recognize his own family members this way. But the closer to circularity, the better they are at this technique. But there's also other things that come with circularity, like less fertility. So although all polygons aspire to be circles, they also tend to have problems generating circles the more sides that they have to themselves. So it's sort of like a law of nature in effect here, I guess, in order to keep the numbers of the elite small. I don't know. Or, well, the yeah. circles, anyway. And many children are, in fact, taken to this therapeutic institute where they try to, like, remove their angles or make their angles smaller and this actually kills a lot of the children of the, like, multi-sided polygons. The circle's not a true circle. It's just a very, very many-sided polygon. Like, it'll have right. 10,000 sides or something like that. So right. in order the to angles skip... are so small yeah. that you can't, like, you can't detect them. Yeah. So they might as well not be there, I guess. Right. Well, there does exist among the Flatlanders a nostalgia for the time of the so-called color revolt when someone named... Chromacistes had the bright idea of painting individuals different colors. And this caught on, and soon everyone was able to practice their own sight recognition due to colors. Certainly would make things a lot more convenient. Yeah, it does. It seems to. And unfortunately, though, there's also a problem among the shapes of Flatland with irregular beings. And as we'll get to in a moment, in this society, configuration is everything. So any, like, deviants in society are blamed on the irregularity of their shapes. Right. And so an irregular being, he has this idea of passing this color bill so that everyone will paint their forehand green and their back ends red. And this would not only serve to equalize everyone and make priests resemble women, but remove the need for sight recognition as it had heretofore been practiced. And the women, of course, love this, and the priests, well, not so much. You can't have that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the color sedition, though, is finally stamped out when an isosceles imitates some kind of multi-sided shape and marries far, far above his station. And there's a conference to which the followers of Chromacistes are lured, and through rhetoric, most are convinced that the color bill will only promulgate fraud and betrayal, and those unconvinced are destroyed in a massacre led by the circles and enacted by both isosceles convicts and women, and color is abolished. 
So finally, our square expresses some doubts about the situation like I was sort of expressing earlier. Kind of got ahead of myself, but the order of things doesn't really matter no. so much. There's actually a lot of background. It's not boring, but it's like over half the book pretty much is built to the, like, dedicated to this sort of world building. And it's an interesting world. Yeah. Even if, though it's very geometrically basic, it's right. a cool concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the whole first part of the book, which is over half. Yeah. is kind of devoted to just describing Flatland and what things are really like there. But there is an actual story to get to, and that is that it's the eve of the year 2000 in Flatland. And the square has a dream of line land. And he sees many straight lines and points, all seeming to move in the same direction simultaneously. And he kind of thinks at first that he's addressing women, but he ends up yelling at the monarch of the land. And he begs pardon, but the two of them can't really understand each other. And the king assumes that the square is aware of all the things he's a, that the king is aware of and feigning ignorance for some reason. And the square has a really superior attitude, being a man of two-dimensional space, but the king is having none of it. He couldn't even hear the square till he placed his mouth on his level. The sound seemed to come from somewhere in his insides, and he learns a bit about line land, that no line can pass another line, and neighborliness is akin to marriage, but not really, because marriage itself is really different. Marriage is consummated by sound, and proximity is actually not important at all, because it's pretty much an accident. So they can't really do anything about it. So it's pretty much done by some kind of oral communication, and two females are born for every male, and they all marry two wives. And this has to do with their voices, which have to do with a three-part harmony coming into sync. And the men have two voices, I guess, and the women have one. So because the Flatlander Square only has one voice, the Lineland King calls him a female monstrosity. And to the Linelanders, space is length, and length is space. Yeah. The king calls to his wives, who are thousands of miles away in opposite directions. And Square believes his space is planar space, and he believes it's true space, and lords it over the king of Lineland, commenting on the life that he must, you know, he must lead a really boring life. And the king, of course, only knows his world and says, no, he says, me and my family are very happy, thanks very much. And he tries to get Square to show him this left and right thing that he keeps talking of. But of course, Square can't do that, since there are no reference terms between them whatsoever. And he endeavors to show him by sort of moving out of the linear space, but the king doesn't think he's moving, just figures he's using some sort of magic shit to disappear. Yeah. And Square talks very condescendingly, and the king is really upset and appears ready to attack this interloper with his subjects. And then suddenly Square wakes up to the sound of the breakfast bell. And it's the beginning, or the dawning of the third millennium, and Square has an argument with his hexagonal grandson about the possibility and uh, meaning of three to the third in mathematical problems. And Square says it's foolish and sends him off to bed, muttering to himself, much to the annoyance of his wife. But then suddenly a presence makes itself felt. It's kind of like one of the ghosts in uh, Christmas Carol or something like that. You know, it's just sort of like suddenly this voice comes in and and reprimands him for saying that his grandson is a fool. And he says three to the third has an obvious meaning in geometry. And the boy is not a fool, and the wife is really outraged because she thinks there's an intruder in the house. And then she feels him, and she recognizes that he's a circle. And so she instantly retires to bed, making all kinds of abject apologies. But it's not just any circle, it's a sphere composed of many circles. and. We begin the exact same rigmarole from earlier, but with a different perspective. And Square and Swoop and Sphere have a dialogue, and Sphere is made up of all these infinite circles stretching into a third dimension. And he says he lives in real space, and he knows lots of things that a Flatlander couldn't possibly know. And Square just says, you're very well informed, aren't you? 
and presents him with all these geometric progressions and so on. But Square is still having none of it. And Sphere tries various tricks, including poking down into Square's insides. But all it does is make Square angry. And then they hear Wife coming. And Sphere seems to have... He seems to have a mission of sorts. And... I'm sorry, Sphere seems to have a mission. He needs to spread the gospel of three dimensions, you see. And he thought this mathematician of Flatland would be a perfect choice. It's the first choice in a thousand years. And now he's being stubborn about it. And Sphere says, send her away quick, or you must accompany me to the world of three dimensions. And once, twice, thrice, it is done. And we get a view from above of Flatland. And Square is very astonished. He wants to bring the truth to the assembled circles who are bringing in the new millennium. Well, there's a sort of ceremony that obviously Square has never seen before because it's a secret circle, right? And he says, there's a death to the apostle of the gospel of three dimensions, chat, or declaration. And that's when Spear leaps in and proclaims his provenance. And a bunch of triangle soldiers are sort of ceremoniously leaping to grab him. And it's like, we've got him! We've got him! He's going! He's gone! And they fail. And he slips away into his third dimension. But the circles are not alarmed because they say this is all in the archives and it's happened before. Twice, in fact. And the police triangles are executed and... Square's brother, who happens to be there, is part of the ceremony, I guess. He's there to read some documents. He's a very good Square. He's very socially responsible. But he's in prison for life now because he's been a witness to the secret knowledge fit only for circles. Well, Square is taken aloft into Spaceland, and he meets a cube, which is obviously an extension of Square's, and he's awestruck. But... He's even more awestruck by another possibility. Pardon me, O thou, whom I must no longer address as the perfection of all beauty. But let me beg thee to vouchsafe thy servant a sight of thine interior. My what? Thine interior, thy stomach, thy intestines. Whence this ill-timed impertinent request? And by what mean you by saying that I am no longer the perfection of all beauty? My lord, your own wisdom has taught me to aspire to one even more great, more beautiful, and more closely approximate to perfection than yourself. As you yourself, superior to all flatman forms, combine many circles in one, so doubtless there is one above you who combines many spheres in one supreme existence, surpassing even the solids of Spaceland, even as we, who are now in space, look down on Flatland and see the insides of all things. So of a certainty there is yet above us some higher, purer region, whither thou dost surely purpose to lead me. O oh, thou whom I shall always call everywhere and in all dimensions, my priest, philosopher, and friend, some yet more spacious space, some more dimensionable dimensionality from the vantage ground of which we shall look down together upon the revealed insides of solid things, and where thine own intestines and those of thy kindred spheres will lie exposed to the view of the poor wandering exile from Flatland to whom so much has already been vouchsafed. Pooh! Stop! Enough of this trifling. The time is short, and much remains to be done before you are fit to proclaim the gospel of the three dimensions to your blind, benighted countrymen in Flatland. Nay, gracious teacher, deny me not what I know it is in thy power to reform. Grant me but one glimpse of thy interior, and I am satisfied forever, remaining henceforth thy docile pupil, thy, thy unemancipable slave ready to receive all thy teachings and to feed upon the words that fall from thy lips. Well, then, to content and silence you, let me say it once. I would shew you what you wish if I could, but I cannot. 
Would you have me turn my stomach inside out to oblige you? But the Lord has shown me the intestines of all my countrymen in the land of two dimensions by taking me with him into the land of three. What, therefore, more easy than now to take his servant on a second journey into the blessed region of the fourth dimension, where I shall look down with him once more upon this land of three dimensions and see the inside of every three dimensions house, the secrets of the solid earth, the treasures of the mines of Spaceland and the intestines of every single living creature, even the noble and adorable spheres. Where is this land of four dimensions? I know not, but doubtless my teacher knows. Not I. There is no such land. The very idea of it is utterly inconceivable. <laughs> not inconceivable, my lord, to me, and therefore still less inconceivable to my master. Nay, I despair not that even here, in this region of three dimensions, your lordship's art may make the fourth dimension visible to me, just as in the land of two dimensions my teacher's skill would fain have opened the eyes of his blind servant to the invisible presence of a third dimension, though I saw it not. Let me recall the past. Was I not taught below that when I saw a line and inferred a plane, I in reality saw a third unrecognized dimension, not the same as brightness, called height? And does it not now, follow that in this region, when I see a plane and fur a solid, I really see a fourth unrecognized dimension, not the same as color, but existent, though infinitesimal and incapable of measurement. And besides this, there is the argument from analogy of figures. Analogy? Nonsense. What analogy? Your lordship tents his servant to see whether he remembers the revelations imparted to him. Trifle not with me, my lord. I crave, I thirst for more knowledge. Doubtless we cannot see that other higher spaceland now because we have no eye in our stomachs. But just as there was the realm of Flatland, though that poor puny Lineland monarch could neither turn to left nor right, to discern it, and just as there was close at hand, and touching my frame, the land of three dimensions, though I, blind, senseless wretch, had no power to touch it, no eye in my interior to discern it, so of a surety there is a fourth dimension which my lord perceives, with the inner eye of thought, and that it must exist, my lord himself has taught me, or can he have forgotten what he himself imparted to his servant? In one dimension, did not a moving point produce a line with two terminal points? In two dimensions, did not a moving line produce a square with four terminal points? In three dimensions, did not a moving square produce... Did not this eye of mine behold it? That blessed being, a cube with eight terminal points? And in four dimensions, shall not a moving cube, alas, for analogy, and alas for the progress of truth, if it be not so. Shall not, I say, the motion of a divine cube result in a still more divine organization with sixteen terminal points? Behold the infallible confirmation of the series. Two, four, eight, sixteen. Is not this a geometrical progression? Is not this, if I might quote my lord's own words, strictly according to analogy? Again, was I not taught by my lord that as I, in a line, there are two bounding points, and in a square there are four bounding lines? So in a cube there must be six bounding squares. Behold once more the confirming series, two Four, six, is not this an arithmetical progression? And consequently, does it not of necessity follow that the more divine offspring of the divine cube in the land of four dimensions must have eight bounding cubes? And is not this also, as my lord has taught me to believe, strictly according to analogy? O oh, my lord, my lord, behold, I cast myself in faith upon conjecture, not knowing the facts, 
and I appeal to your lordship to confirm or deny my logical anticipations. If I am wrong, I yield, and will no longer demand a fourth dimension. But if I am right, my lord will listen to reason. I ask, therefore, is it or is it not the fact that ere now your countrymen also have witnessed the descent of beings of a higher order than their own, entering closed rooms even as your lordship entered mine without the opening of doors or windows and appearing and vanishing at will. On the reply to this question, I am ready to stake everything. Deny it, and I am henceforth silent. Only vouchsafe an answer. It is recorded so, but men are divided in opinion as to the facts. And even granting the facts, they explain them in different ways. In any case, however great may be the number of different explanations, no one has adopted or suggested a theory of a fourth dimension. Therefore, pray have done with this trifling, and let us return to business. I was certain of it. I was certain that my anticipations would be fulfilled. And now have patience with me, and answer me yet one more question, best of teachers. Those who have thus appeared, no one knows whence, and have returned, no one knows whither. Have they also contracted their sections and vanished somehow into that more spacious space whither I now entreat you to conduct me? They have vanished, certainly, if they ever appeared. But most people say that these visions arose from the thought. You will not understand me. From the brain, from the perturbed angularity of the seer. Say they so? Oh, believe them not. Or if it indeed be so, that this other space is really Thoughtland, then take me to that blessed region where I, in thought, shall see the insides of all solid things. There, before my ravished eyes, a cube moving in some altogether new direction, but strictly according to analogy, so as to make every particle of his interior pass through a new kind of space, with a wake of its own, shall create a still more perfect perfection than himself, with sixteen terminal extra solid angles and eight solid cubes for his perimeter. And once there, shall we stay our upward course? In that blessed region of four dimensions, shall we linger at the threshold of the fifth and not enter therein? Ah, no, let us rather resolve that our ambition shall soar with our corporal ascent. Then, yielding to our intellectual onset, the gates of the sixth dimension shall fly open. After that, a seventh, and then an eighth. With all that, then, our square is precipitated back down to Flatland, hurled forth in disgust. But he does have a merciful dream of the Wizen Sphere taking him, Square, to Pointland, where he can see a creature of pure solipsistic thought working in zero-dimensional space. And he finds it very contemptible. And Sphere says he was wrong to be angry and shows him greater things. And it's probably just some dream because Square is, yeah, he's, he's all taken. He keeps thinking that, that he's going to be able to show everyone what a cube is. But the more time that goes by, the harder it is for him to sort of reproduce the image in his mind. And he tries and fails to convert his grandson to the gospel of three dimensions. But there's this town crier sort of person outside and he's making the declaration of death, the proclamation of death to all who claim to have knowledge of other worlds and spaces. They must be destroyed. It's a pretty good deterrent. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's like in the middle of this really good discussion and then all of a sudden... <laughs> yeah. Death of the heretics. Right. <laughs> so the grandson denies that he ever said anything special about three to the third. And he he's like, oh, you must be joking. And he runs out. It's a failure. And 
Square really seems to be losing it. Yeah. You can barely remember what a cube is like anymore. And he goes to this academic conference, and just in the middle of this, like, really shitty paper uh, discussion of something that he knows is not true, why the universe must be bound by two dimensions, he storms off and goes on this big rant about everything and, and all the things that he says he knows, and he's instantly arrested. And his fate is perpetual imprisonment. And because he has knowledge of three dimensions, and I guess he read a a mythology book. <laughs> he has knowledge of Prometheus, yeah, and right. so he likens himself to Prometheus, and he's trying to bring knowledge to the people, and in the end, his only companion is his brother, and his brother is really annoying. He doesn't believe in three <laughs> dimensions, and he's like, he saw the sphere, and he's just like, oh, no, you know, just something, I don't know, something in the air. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so, he has no friends. But he managed to get this manuscript out to Spaceland, so I guess that's cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, interesting. This is a lot of fun. No, it, it definitely was. And I think it, <laughs> it does two things really well. The first thing is the satire on Victorian social values, where everybody is quite literally hard-coded into their social roles by these rigid forms that have to be exactly the same angle in order to fulfill their societal function. And also the idea of multiple dimensions, of existences higher than our own that we're not able to perceive, and that if any evidence of said dimensions were to come into our world, we would just completely disbelieve it for how utterly ridiculous it would sound. Yeah. Not even Square, after having a dream about Lineland, the whole interaction with the spear, which right. happens on the very next day, yeah. doesn't, like, <laughs> right. <laughs> he never even yeah. sees that it's a parallel until a little bit later, and of course he becomes the most greatest convert of the gospel of many dimensions, yeah. as you could possibly imagine. Yeah, But the social satire based on very simple roles in society and very strange portrayal of the women and like the circles and their absolute mental hold over everything right mostly through ignorance like that seems to be mostly the way they operate that's kind of like a real comment on i guess religious institutions and stuff oh absolutely yeah especially yeah it is pretty cutting in the satire yeah and interesting coming from a priestly person himself right too. He doesn't really mention God a lot in the book, but it does come up a couple of times. Yeah. You know, it seems like it's just casually mentioned, though. Like, it's not really... It's up to us shapes to sort out our problems. <laughs> <laughs> Polygons. And <laughs> you can't think about it too much. Like, I mean, obviously, in our three-dimensional world, like, we think that we have features that are a little bit more elaborated than just our geometric shapes. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of a weird way of looking at it, but... I can see why he did it this way. And like, it creates a lot of identification with really simple models and shapes. And like, yeah, it's a cool world. I mean, how he constructs it. Hmm. Lineland, on the other hand, sounds like it would be awful to live in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think of all the, the, uh, the fantastic worlds we visited on the podcast, Lineland is probably Lineland the, is place the I most would go limited. Least, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, different people might see that in different ways. Like, yeah. The most basic computer graphics like that you could possibly imagine versus right. multi-million dollar CGI from 2021. Yeah. It's really interesting how much influence this seems to have had. A lot of it does remind me of the beginning of the speech in the time machine where yeah. the inventor character is sort of trying to express ideas of dimensionality in space. Right. It reminded me of that one bit from Slaughterhouse Five where he tries to portray beings that exist in the fourth dimension. I totally forgot about that. I read, I read that book, and there was a lot in that book that I probably don't remember. So, but that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, because <laughs> you know, like as you're moving, you're moving through three dimensional space, but you were in a different space a second before. So, beings right. that exist in this fourth dimension would see you as a worm moving through space you know like the giant elegated body because your mm. entire existence takes up like 
the entire course of three dimensional space you've moved on over the course of your life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that that kind of reminded me of uh, of that in a way of what trying to portray extra dimensional being might look like going upwards. Because as being three dimensional beings, it's difficult to picture something that would be in a fourth dimension being at time or some other abstract mathematical dimension. Yeah. So I would definitely suggest that this is worth a read. And I think that yeah. it's and it's written though with a little bit of humor too. So like it doesn't take itself that seriously. A lot of the like the monologues and stuff, you can tell there's a certain amount of tongue in cheek quality to it. No, for sure. And this is also quite short as well. Yeah. So I think that that's pretty much all I have to say on Flatland by Edwin Abbott. And unless you have anything else to add, then I think that it's time that we start rounding up with what we're going to be covering next month at the end of October on Chrononauts. All right. Next month, we are going to be taking a look at fiction that is closer to the real world. You might think of science fiction where people are using computers or something of a current contemporary technology to do something. And we are going to be taking a look at fiction that incorporates what was then high technology in their stories. So we are going to be looking at the telegraph and the radio, which was originally a wireless telegraph. So they're very closely related, and they make their way into the fiction quite early. So we are going to be looking at three stories from a anthology of telegraph fiction called Lightning Flashes and Electric Dashes. The first by Ralph Pope, $1,000 Reward, My Foot Race with a Telegram. The second being... Henry Van Hovenberg's Into the Jaws of Death, a telegraph operator's story, and the third being Charles Bernard's Kate, an electromechanical romance. We are also going to be returning to the Spanish author Clarine with his story Goodbye Lamb, which is a commentary on, I guess, what we were talking before on how technology can change a society and not for the better and the symbol of technological progress in this story is the telegraph so when the telegraph becomes wireless that kicked off a whole nother wave of radio fiction and ideas of radio and the popular conscious we're going to be returning to rudyard kipling for his 1902 story Wireless. We are going to be reading Algernon Blackwood's Wireless Confusion from 1921. We are going to be also reading Theodore Sturgeon's Ether Breather, published in Astounding Stories in 1939. And we're going to be finishing up the episode with a novel, The Campfire Girls of Roselawn, or A Strange Message from the Air which was part of the Radio Girls series. One of those novels that has a whole bunch of different titles. So yeah, I think it'll be an interesting episode. A lot of fiction that incorporates contemporary technologies in, well, hopefully they'll be interesting ways. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to, I know a lot of them are very short as well. Yes. And might just present uh, interesting conundrums. We might take a slightly different approach to this episode, I think. I, I kind of feel like maybe uh, what we'll maybe do is talk more generally about some of the stories. I don't know. We'll talk about it. But I think that it's going to be an interesting, different look at technology as it was. Yeah, absolutely. As it developed. And the stories from Lightning Flashes and Electric Dashes we posted on the blog spot. You can also get the full book online from Google Books, but these are with the OCR text and with the illustrations, so easy to access and read. All right. So we've had a lot of fun tonight working with mathematics, and we hope to see you next time when we start working with the telegraph. Indeed. And make sure... Practice your arithmetic and keep your sums good. You never know how it might help you in the future. This is Chrononauts, and we will be back next month. Good night, everybody.